Hi everyone, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the poster that I presented at the American Geophysical Union Conference last week in Washington, D.C. This is work that I've been doing at the NASA Ames Research Center for the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute, which is my parent organization, which is a nonprofit partner of NASA. And this is all part of my work as a member of the NASA Earth Exchange, or NEX. Now, before I talk about my poster, I will also mention that I have an eye poster, which I think I'll present off of because I put more information in it than the physical one because you can. Um, but before I even get into that, I wanted to mention two things before we get started just to give you guys some context. So the first thing I want to talk about is LIDAR. If you've not heard of LIDAR, you've probably heard of sonar and radar. And so it works basically on the same principle. So sonar uses sound or sort of echolocation. Radar uses radio waves. LIDAR uses light or visible light or maybe a shortwave near infrared. And so in the case of the LIDAR that I use, it's mounted on a plane and scans the Earth's surface kind of like this. And what you get is a 3D representation of points known as a point cloud because you just have these discrete points. But if they're all very densely spaced together, you can make out the features like this is a power line. These are some trees and you can, in some cases, not some cases, but a lot of cases, you can also see you know, buildings. And so this is a really powerful technology that can be used to map out a terrain. And if you can imagine doing this on a large scale, there come some challenges with processing that data and putting it into the hands of people. This brings me to my second point. This is the Earth Science Action Mission at NASA, which I believe just started in 2024. Now, this is a mission that is designed to help us as at NASA provide actionable earth science data to people who may need it. So we're talking about maybe farmers or firefighters or policymakers, people who really could use NASA data and integrate it into their own work to make decisions. And we want to make our products just more easily accessible than they have before. So this is sort of the two lead ups to my actual poster. So let's go into the poster right now. So the title of my poster is Developing an Open Source USGS 3DEP Data Processing Workflow for Actionable Products. Now, USGS stands for the United States Geological Survey. They're the agency of the government responsible for watching over the natural terrain of the nation. And the 3D Elevation Program is a program that is meant to map out the entire United States with LIDAR. So imagine for every one square meter in the United States, uh, excluding Alaska. I think it's going to be five meters there because of its just gargantuan size. Imagine for like the lower 48 states, for every one meter by one meter square or three feet by three feet square, you can get an accurate elevation measurement of around 10 centimeters. And so this is what 3DEP is trying to do. It's been going on for about, I think, eight or nine years now. And they're trying to get like every eight year cycle uh, recollects. Now you can imagine this is a lot of work because you have to get people to fly the planes, take the data, standardize the data, give it to 3DEP, 3DEP has to process it, and it's it's a lot of work. So 3DEP will provide the raw point cloud data as well as a one meter digital elevation model that's basically just the bare earth terrain that's removing all of the buildings and the vegetation. And again, this is a primary data source for topographic mapping and surface analysis, but there's also applications in like wildfire uh, impact research, flood modeling, urban planning, and just a whole litany of, of use cases. So this is extremely valuable information. So my main objectives were to create and maintain a flexible data processing pipeline that is both user-friendly and easily customizable for any one specific use case to enhance 3 depths utility and range of applications, including you know wildfire risk assessment, terrain analysis, um, building planning, urban urban management planning, vegetation management, and just to overall provide more actionable LiDAR data products than what we currently have. To accomplish this goal, I created a data processing workflow or pipeline that takes the raw USGS 3 depth point cloud LiDAR data, and with the NASA Pleiades supercomputer, I run these two separate routines. I needed to use two different routines because to get all the products we wanted, we couldn't just get them in one or the other. And so I've broken it up into two separate routines, one that uses Python on the left, one that uses the R statistical language on the right. And we create a whole host of different elevation model products. 
And so there's a lot of them here. I don't want to get into every single one, but basically the top three digital train model is something that already the USGS 3D provides. Digital surface model is basically a representation of the uh, natural of the surface, as the name suggests. So that's um, let me see if I can have the description here. Yeah, it captures both the natural and the artificial surface features, representing sort of the highest hit or the first return from a LiDAR laser pulse. So that's sort of the top of buildings, the top of the canopies. And then the canopy height model is essentially just the difference between these two models. And what those what that gives you is essentially the height of objects with respect to the ground. Okay, so again, there's a lot of those products here, but basically this is a tile in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, which is where I'm from. And so this is the digital terrain model. And this is from a data set taken from 2010 and 2023 over the same tile. And then I've also looked at the differences between the two. So you can actually see how things have changed over the years. Like I said, the digital surface model will represent sort of the highest hit returns from the LiDAR. So you can make out the trees and the buildings. So this is, um, these are sort of residential buildings on both sides of the park here. And then the canopy height model is just the difference between the DSM and the DTM. And I find this just really cool because you can you can clearly see you know, vegetation and, and buildings. And then you can also see where things have changed over the years in the 13 years since those two data sets have been taken. So bluer points means things are a bit taller than they were. And then red means that things were things were um, higher in 2010 than they were in 2023. So I think this is just really cool data to be looking at here. There's other maps we can create as well. And now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the applications that we can use it for. So for example, this is a canopy height model at 60 centimeter resolution for Santa Clara County. So this was a LIDAR campaign that flew over the entire Santa Clara County in California. That's where San Jose, California is. This is where NASA Ames Research Center is up here. I live somewhere over, over here. And as you can see, it's just this really beautiful map that shows how high things are relative to the ground. So you can see um, the, the high redwood trees here in the sort of the southern, southwestern part of the, of the map and uh, just these really beautiful features. And you can imagine just really zooming in. I can't zoom in here because it's not high enough resolution, but you can really just zoom in and see the spatial resolution resolving these objects that are. This is a particular use case that I found just by asking a very simple question. I wanted to know, was it possible with this LiDAR data, this really high quality LiDAR data, could we see hazardous vegetation, hazardous you know, tall trees near electrical transmission lines. That's a really common cause of how fires start in California. You have tall trees and they you know, hit a power line and then a fire starts. And I, was, I just wanted to know, was it possible to see this? And then sure enough, you can see this. And so if you look on the right-hand side here, the state regulation for this area dictates that trees cannot be above five meters within around, I think, 12 meters from the the wire. So every dot you see here is essentially just a pixel that I've designated as a tree pixel. So I've essentially done some segmentation here to identify what the tree pixels are, but I've measured how, how high they are on the y-axis to how close they are to the wire or the closest wire pixel to that tree pixel. And you can clearly see that there are these you know pixels that indicate that there, this is sort of against the uh, regulation, which I thought is just really interesting. I don't know, I don't know who we're getting in trouble, but a very, very cool application there. And then this is a pre and post Tubbs Fire map of an area near Calistoga, California. Tubbs Fire up to date was sort of the worst fire in California history. It happened in 2017. And as you can see here in the lower bottom portion, you can see there's an obvious decrease in the tree canopy structure between these five years. Actually, in the poster I presented, I actually have a residual map of that same area. So I'm just going to go here and zoom in really quickly. But you can really see here, right, just the residual between the 2018 and the 2013 map, just how much uh, vegetation was lost in this region. And this is just one metric, right? We're just using pure canopy height to, to look at the um, damage, but there are just a, a litany of other products, like I said before, that we can create like percentile metrics, like median or 25th percentile, 75th percentile, um, skew, kurtosis, standard deviation, just so many types of products that we can use to study how things have changed over time with the LiDAR data.
So with that, that's the end of my poster presentation. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this gave you a better idea as to what I do at the NASA Ames Research Center. And I sure hope you tune in for future videos of mine where I will talk more about other projects that I do and other scientific questions that I hope to answer in the future. So stay tuned.